Welcome to Power Boat Talk, the podcast where we talk everything performance boats with your host, Joe Road. Hello, welcome to Power Boat Talk. This episode is brought to you by BoatLoanGuy.com and owner Scott Angle. Scott will do his best to make your boat or RV purchase as quick and as stress-free as possible. Scott offers loans for as low as $20,000 and up to $5 million, which should be enough to take care of the boat of your dreams. He offers loans for as long as 20 years, and oftentimes he'll give you a same-day approval on no-doc loans. Scott guarantees the best rates in the industry. Follow Scott on Instagram and Facebook at RV and Boat Loans, or go to BoatLoanGuide.com for more information or to fill out an application. This episode is brought to you by SoCal Jet Boats, with owners Brad and Brittany Martin. I had the pleasure of having Brad on episode 28 of Powerboat Talk, so go check that out. SoCal Jet Boats was one of the original online forums and is still a great resource for all kinds of performance boat info. SoCal Jet Boats also has an online store that has a fantastic selection of hot boat apparel and a full line of jet pump parts and accessories. SoCal Jet Boats is also a great supporter of boat racing out here on the West Coast, and you can find them at most ADBA and NJBA drag boat races and the Southern California Speedboat Club Circle Boat Races. You can also find them on one of the stops on their California River Summer Tour, which is going on now. Follow SoCal Jet Boats on Instagram and Facebook, or go to SoCalJetBoats.com for more information. Today I have with me Mr. Lauren Liable. Lauren is a longtime offshore racer and just a boating enthusiast, and he's doing some really cool things now with a with a restored classic Apache that uh, we're going to talk about. And uh, uh, Lauren actually has been doing some of the Ocean Cup Series races, which are point to point, uh, you know, old school, tough offshore, you know, out in the open races. So we'll talk about that too. So Lauren, thanks for uh, taking my call. Appreciate it. Oh, very happy to be here with you. What's, when's the first, you know, you guys are all set for the event. I think it's the first one I believe is in June, right? You're Yes, June in uh, Palm Beach. It's a repeat of last year's event, the, the first one they ever did on the East Coast that I'm aware of. Yeah, and and you have for your class, and I can't remember what your class is, but I think you have the record for that, right? Yeah, not to uh, minimize the record, but, you know, it was the first time out there for us, and so the first guy out sets the record, I guess. So uh, I, I was just thrilled that we were, a, one, invited, and two, I was able to get Bobby Latham back in a race boat like 40 years plus later and uh, he was thrilled to do it and then we had ryan beckley as navigator and i picked ryan because he's really into the history of offshore he has a museum that a lot of guys have been donating oh cool uh, uniforms hats helmets whatever pieces of the past and ryan is really worked hard on that. So I thought he'd like to get into a, as a racer himself, currently he would like the old style of the 150 mile nonstop race and uh, not run what you brung, but whatever the conditions are, they are and then let it go. And so he was thrilled to jump on and, and he's also a pretty skillful navigator. Which, uh, which navigator, yeah, it takes, takes on a whole new meeting when you're not Running a, running near well, the shore where you can see the shore, yeah. right? <laughs> In the old days, um, the navigation was critical because the races, the, forgetting that the races were long, the legs were so long, it took you halfway through the le- through the race, depending on the complexity of the course, to kind of know where you were without the compass. Hmm. And uh, I remember doing a race in New Orleans, which is hardly an ocean, it was a Popeye's Grand Prix, and uh, it was foggy at the start, oh. and it and it got worse as the race went on. And we were in a <clears throat> V bottom at that time, and the Seahawk guys and the rest of the fast boats like Popeyes and Superboat, because we all started at the same time, they went in their direction way faster than we could ever dream of going, and. Johnny, who was navigating at the time, Johnny Tomlinson, just said, don't stay on your course, stay on your course. We didn't have intercoms, but he kept pointing. And just out of nowhere, full flute, because you couldn't see over the bow, literally. Sunny, but you couldn't see anything. And 
all of a sudden I see as the other guys, Bobby and myself, we see the bridge. And then bang, there's a turnboat <laughs> out of nowhere. <laughs> so we had no idea whether the other guys found it or didn't. And uh, as it turned out, they went way in the wrong direction as fast as they were. But they never caught us because they had to take so long to come back and correct course. So mm -hmm. navigating in those days was uh, beyond a skill and a beyond essential because we used to pace too. I and mean, we didn't, the motors would never, couldn't run flat out for the whole race. Oh, okay. And, uh, they were just as high horsepower as you could get back then, like 500, let's say in 86, maybe a little more. And Crash boxes were fine, but the drives also, could, there was no number sixes. The fours were just starting to come out. Uh, so we were stuck with number fours, and they had to be rebuilt every race. So uh, it was a real test on the equipment. So you just couldn't run flat out. You'd pace, mm -hmm. run together. If you were with V bottoms, you ran with the Vs. If you were in a cat, you ran each other. And then somebody would say, enough and go. And hope he made it. <laughs> and then the other guys oh. generally would pick him up, you know, with a leg to go because he's broken because he went too hard. <laughs> and uh, so those days were all about attrition. And uh, but an amazing group of guys. I mean, I'm getting a little off topic, but that's okay. It's, like, it's the, great stuff. The the memories kind of flood back. You know, when you start, I think about New Orleans. I think of some of the funny stuff that happened down there. Um, and <laughs> We had one funny incident after the race because we had won. We would we would be the first guy out of the water, right? And generally, we used to race to the crane too because you wanted to get out of the water quick and you know clean the boat up. There, it wasn't so bad because it was fresh water. Our rig uh, was parked um, on the street because it was just tight marina. Uh, parking, excuse me, down there. And uh, we were wedged between a Lincoln town car and the car behind us. And there was a guy that was a hell of a nice guy named Joe Rupert. He later went on, he had a boat called Boss Hog, who was a, the old Seahawk 41, amongst other boats he had. And he was a 300 plus pound guy, but the nicest guy in the world. We're, by, we're sitting at the boat and we get a panic phone call. My uh, driver can't get the truck out. It's too tight. And we're first in line. We're under the crane. So uh, we run over. It's not that far. We run off the boat, tell the crane guy to hang loose for a second. We run over to the boat. Joe Rupert's there. We run up to the trailer. Joe Rupert's there. And we're kind of scratching our heads. What do we do? So Joe said, you guys push and I'll bounce. What, what does that mean? He lies on the hood of the car and bounces on it. Every time it bounces, it, the front wheels come off the ground. And then you guys moved it? A little bit. And we kept pushing and pushing and pushing <laughs> until we had the, the Lincoln with the hood crushed in on a 45-degree angle so we could get our truck out. So Joe saved the day that day with his uh, weight. That sure sounds like that's something Joe's done before, right? Because he just... <laughs> He, he knew how that. to get that car to move, you know, with his, he just knew it was a oh, Rupert technique, I guess. Oh my gosh. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. There's got to be a million of those, million of those stories, but I didn't, you know, the attrition part in it, you think about it, man, that makes sense, right? It's just, you know, kind of just stare each other down and decide who's going to test their stuff and hope it lasts. Well, again, I, I was fresh to the sport. I got introduced to it by, Ben Kramer and Bobby Sassetti. Uh, innocently, I had a pleasure cigarette um, that, funnily enough, went to KSW, who I found in Powerboat magazine back then. Mm. They had a small little, you know, envelope size ad in the mm -hmm. magazine about performance engines. I never linked them to the Seahawk race team because I wouldn't even know who the Seahawk racing team was. But uh, so the motors were in Canada, the, where the boat was, and there was not too many guys that I trusted to do Marine stuff. So from the ad, I called KS and W and then they did the motors boat ran great. 
And then the Rob report, I don't know if you remember that magazine. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, came out. And uh, the there was a full-page ad with Warpath in the air, one of the most iconic shots in offshore, advertising Fort Apache Marina. So I phoned up, and a guy answered the phone, and his name was Ben Kramer. And he said, why don't you come down and visit the facility and uh, make a deal where you could store your boat here? Because that's what I called. I'd like to bring it okay. down there for the winter okay. and use it. Okay. Right? Uh-huh. And uh, rather than have it sit in storage in Canada, so I could use it a bit in the winter. So I fly down, and <clears throat> uh, I walk into the office, and he said, uh, good to meet you. You, what I'd like to do is, before we talk about renting a, a, a space on my rack, I have to go over to the boat manufacturing shop. Why don't you come with me? We'll, you know, talk stuff. And um, and you can meet my throttle man, Bobby Sassenti, because he's over at the shop. And we'll go get a bite to eat. And uh, like, I'm like, wow, are you kidding me? The one thing I did notice, though, was there was a brown UPS truck there delivering drives. And the UPS driver, when I went into Kramer's office, was sitting at a desk counting 20s. And so I guess they pay in cash. You know, like I'm oblivious to everything. Uh Uh, But there's a lot of drives. (laughs) That part I wasn't oblivious to. It was like, you know, they come in those big boxes, so they look more than you get. But it was a lot of boxes. So we left kind of around 1130, I think it was. We go to the Hollywood uh, area in Florida where the manufacturer is, and I meet Mark McManus, and and there was a bunch of V-bottoms being built, race boats and pleasure boats. And Bobby walks me around, and uh, I'm like, I have a 38 cigarette. I thought it was a cool boat, but these things are like, holy this is a new era. Anyway, we go to a restaurant that they love to go to for lunch called Joey Sonkins. Joey Sonkins was a restaurant that the mob guys in Miami, when they, when they came down from New York, they just lived and breathed this Joey Sonkins. It was on the intercoastal. And it was really good on top of that. It was like steaks and pasta. It was an amazing restaurant. Anyway... We're having lunch there, and these guys think they should move over and convince me to buy a race boat. So the whole lunch is spent. Sell your boat, buy a race boat. We'll make it. <clears throat> we'll get you a throttle guy, and we'll run the race team for you. And like I'm not thinking about racing at all. Because yeah, even... you, you haven't raced a cigarette yet, have you? No, I just, it was a pleasure boat. I, I jumped out of sailing and went into pleasure, into power boats. And uh, I listened, but I still wanted to talk about renting the rack. You know, that's what I really came to. So they said, you know what? We're testing a race boat tomorrow. Why don't you come for a ride? That suddenly I'm good for that. Yeah. So... I'm now I'm really excited. So we go back to Fort Apache. And the reason I brought up the UPS truck was guess who was still there counting 20s? <laughs> <laughs> it was, I still didn't put two and two together yet. Uh-huh, but, uh-huh. but I guess, like as dumb as I was or I am, I guess 20s take a long time. Right. <laughs> so anyway, especially see, a lot I of- left. And it was like about, I don't even know what time then, 2.30, 3 o'clock. And I don't know what time he got there. <laughs> and he's still counting 20s when I left. So I went back to the hotel, and I'm so excited about my boat ride. And I wake up the next morning to the sound of pouring rain. Uh. Uh, so as I'm lying there, I don't know to call them. or they Anyway, the phone rings. And it's Bobby. He said, look, it's pouring rain. We'll, we'll, we'll kill it for today, but we're on for tomorrow, same time. So, I, like, I'm 
upset, but at the same time, I'm thrilled I'm going to get my ride. And um, I come out, sit, you know, there was nothing to do all day. And uh, Sunday morning, Bobby calls, we're leaving, meet us. And so I go over to Hallover, uh, which is, there is a much improved, bigger, expanded marina now. But back then it was just the charter fishing boats mm-hmm, mm-hmm. along and, and a gas dock. And uh, I get there way early and I'm standing there and standing there on the pier. And then I hear that rumble and the boats, you know, slowing down from a plane down to an idle. And now I can see it. And uh, it's the it's the famed blue and cream warpath. Wow. The one in the picture. Wow. So uh, as I as the boat pulls up, I just be you know help it dock you know i grab it and i'm about to get on when kramer gets off and he's got a duffel bag and he says i'll be right back big like a big black duffel bag you know bigger than not quite as big as a hockey duffel bag but big and he walks right over the deck with the duffel bag past me and there's like a grassy hill by the dock and he runs up the hill and there's a black stretch Lincoln sitting at the top of the bridge that I can barely see. And he hands the duffel bag to somebody and comes back. And he says, ah, it was just the mayor. And then he jumps in the boat and off we go. I, like, I, I was used to that a little bit because I'm in the house building business. So we've had our moment too. And so, but I never really got up as high as the mayor. But anyway, I was more of a building inspector guy. I was going to say the building so, inspectors, those are the guys, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, that's like a you know a patio door or some hockey tickets or baseball yeah, yeah, tickets. Yeah. Anyway, so we idle out under the bridge, get up on plane, and it is you couldn't pick for a neophyte or first time ride better conditions. Not super sunny, no breeze, but a leftover ocean swell, and Bobby is just mass. I didn't know boats throttled that way. I, you know, how would I know? And he is just, I'm just like, I don't know where to look. I'm, I'm not looking at the ocean. I'm looking at, holy shit, we're in the air. I'm looking at Bobby going back and forth. We run down to government cut and turn around and come back. And so one way is a following swell and the other one's a head swell. And the boat is, I mean, I've run my cigarette at, in the 80s but nothing like this in really rough conditions. I'd never been in these conditions except when I sailed boats and it's a whole different deal Mm -hmm. because you just go over and the waves and come down. Uh, And so we're just flying over them. And that off and on sound is like a symphony to me. And we come in and we go back on plane all the way to Fort Apache with that 188th. And the only time we came off plane was to uh, turn in that little inlet to go down 188. There were no speed wow. or no wake things at that time. Mm-hmm. So we um, come in and so he says, now you want to buy a race boat? <laughs> and I said, well, if my mind was ever pushed over the edge, it was today. I'll get back to you. So he says, you know what? Why don't you come as my guest? to the the race in New Jersey. It's uh, in a couple of weeks. And I'll get you out on this uh, trawler and you can watch the race from there. The bed, you don't have to do that. He said, that's nah, no problem. Just a phone call. Okay. So I go to New Jersey and uh, that whole New Jersey scene with the motels and the black Cadillacs on at every no- motel up and down the shore. <laughs> In Point Pleasant, I kind of got that story. And I go out on the trawler, and that race was the race where they took that great footage of Warpath that Richie Lures narrated. Okay. You know, they're not they're they're not taking any scalps today. There's nobody else out here. I mean, I got the verbiage down, memorized. Yeah. It was spectacular footage. Unfortunately, the boat broke. So I didn't see them after the race because I had a plane to catch, and I went back to Toronto. 
And then about a week later, Ben calls. He says, you know what? I'm having my own race. And it's in Miami. Why don't you come down and you can fly in the helicopter this time? And that was the race that they debuted, the, the banner boat, you know, the red Apache with the white scroll on the side that said uh, Team Apache. And they pulled that boat out of the golf bag. And the race was so rough that it was black flagged in Bimini. It was Miami to Bimini and back. It didn't make it. It just went to Bimini, black flag. Ben was leading, so he won. And I come back to Fort Apache and meet him later. And he goes, um, Key West is coming up. Come down there as my guest. And uh, I said, Ben, I don't know if I'm getting into racing or not, but <laughs> he's been so hospitable. He, he, he was so, uh, like... I didn't know any of that stuff at the time, like I should, maybe should have. Um, but I knew I had heard all the rumors. And now that I've been to a few races, I got the the lowdown on the Seahawk guys. And they had built my motor, so I had a little more history with them uh, going back. And I get to Key West. And in those days, the uh, dry pits were in a shopping center on on US yeah. one, okay. uh, I think it was K I think it was the Kmart shopping center. It, the shopping center is still there, but Kmart lo is long gone. So all the boats are in this parking lot. I get the cab to from Key West Airport. He drops me. I, I say, okay, right here is good enough. And um, uh, I go in and um, I see a boat, a big Cougar V bottom. And I had never seen one of those before, aluminum, white, and it said Maggie's Mercruiser Special. And the throttle man, or sorry, the driver was George, the owner was George Morales. But what was it really unique about this boat, after I got over looking at the boat, was he had world champion, 83, with the, in gold, with the you know those little floral leaves that they put on trophies, so oh, on yeah. either side of the sure. uh, on sure. either side of the eighty three, and then he won the year before, so he had it on eighty four, but he also had it on eighty five, which hadn't been run yet. <laughs> I thought this guy is, yeah. and it was just to psycho Al Copeland. Uh -huh. And as it turned out, he did win because Copeland broke. <clears throat> and Morales broke too, but he got it running again. It was a triple engine Cougar. Anyway, while I was strolling around, I saw the Seahawk support trailer. And I thought, oh, you know what? I never went there. I just did everything on the phone. So I walked in and uh, there was a guy sitting at the desk. And um, I said, hi, uh, I'm Lauren Lively, and You guys did my motors for me. And he said, yeah, hi, I'm Tom Allen. I'm the parts manager and, and shop uh, foreman. I said, uh, he said, how are your motors? I said, great. And I said, I'm down here with, uh, with Ben Kramer as his guest. He said, well, why don't you go racing instead of playing around with a pleasure boat? <laughs> and he said, I want to leave Seahawk. And he told me his reasons for wanting to leave Obviously, the temperature in the room was going up, right, where where they were. Uh, or maybe the writing was on the wall. And he said, I'll be your crew chief, and I'll get the whole team organized. And we can base it in Miami. Just find a boat. And he suggested a V-bottom. The cats were, you know, coming into vogue in that time. But he said, mm -hmm. start off with a V-bottom and uh, get your feet wet. So... I was just so enamored with the guy and we just got along so good right off the bat that I dumped the 41 Apache idea and started looking for a race boat. And uh, I met the C and G guys back then and we flew together to Bimini to look at the old Ajax Hawk. And it had been, uh, the reason we went to look at it was for sale because the guy that owned it got zapped 
so he needed <laughs> money for his attorney. We got there, and the Bahamians had already, you know, pilfered the boat pretty good for things they needed, like compasses, yeah, <laughs> and uh, carburetors. It was because the boat had been flipped off the injectors, injection. So they kind of took what they wanted, and there was in those crystal blue waters. I can see it like it was yesterday. The green grass growing off that boat was about a foot long, just you know, kind of wafting in the in the in the calm water, you know, <clears throat> as the boat listed at the dock. So I phoned Tommy. He said, "You don't want that boat anyway." Um, so I came back to Miami and almost bought the boat that Craig Barry raced. We raced against each other in '86. He had that '39 cigarette. But it was for sale with through him initially. And I looked at it and uh, I called Tommy and he said, nah, you got to find something better than that. And uh, I ended up, I remember I was in a Turnberry Hotel with my brother and I went to, of all places, the Yellow Pages. Like a lot of people don't know what the Yellow Pages are, but... It was like a Google of phone advertiser and private people. So there was a white pages and a yellow pages. The white was for regular phones and the yellow was for classified stuff. So there's a performance Marine called Dollar Marine. Oh, sure. So we jump in the rental car, we run over there and uh, meet Ron Dollar. And uh, he says, I have just what you need. And uh, it was a, a cigarette that had originally was called Island Runner and was sent over. It, the guy sold it and it went over to Japan. And so it had Merck injected motors. The guy raced it over there a little bit. All the pictures were Polaroids on a hydro hoist or on the trailer or just different still shots that he had in his desk. So Ronnie made a deal for me as my broker and the boat arrived. I got, I called Tommy. I said, are you okay with this boat? He said, yep. And he said, we'll send it to Miami. I have some buddies that have opened up a Marine service thing called TNT. So it was Johnny and Mike. Uh, and they had the shop off of Biscayne Boulevard on the other side of the railroad tracks. It's now the big Toyota dealership. Uh, sorry, Infinity dealership or Lexus, sorry, Lexus. It's a huge Lexus dealer now. Anyway, we, uh, the boat shows up just right around Christmas time. And that's 85 and we're going to run an 86. And so, uh, the boat shows up, I get a phone call from Ronnie, come on down. Uh, we have it on the battery chargers should be ready to go. We'll put fuel in it tomorrow and you can run. I have a kid here you can run with. So I get down, I'm so excited. I get to Dollar's shop and they, the boat fired up, they said, no problem. And we'll, they took it over to 188 and we splashed it. And the kid that's going to run with me is Phil Lipschitz, who works oh at Dollar's. God. So Philly drives and I throttle. And obviously I had that little bit of an experience with, uh, Bobby Ciceni, so I sort of knew what yes, you're a pro how now. it sounded more than what you're supposed to do, and uh, Philly helped me a little bit with the tabs because it was sort of rough outside, and we went through haul over, and we're running, and it, it, I'm just having like the greatest time of my life. Philly'd never been in a boat like this, so he's going nuts. How much fun it is, and now because it's that time of year, it gets dark pretty early in Miami. So we turn around and come back to what we, we, we went north, as I recall, to Holly, to, uh, up to Hollywood. And as we're coming back, we see two boats come out, like towards us. And it's the guys from C&G. And they have uh, <laughs> Betty Cook's old scarab, as I recall. And there was a boat that Aaron built called the 41 Squadron that was sort of the predecessor to the Apache. They had that too. And each guy was, it was just one guy, it was Paul Churchill and, and uh, 
Uh, I'm bad on the name. Uh, uh, Randy. <laughs> you've, been pretty, Randy. you've been pretty yeah, good Randy so far. <laughs> Garcia. And uh, they're in each boat. So we they're running and we I turn around and start running with them. And now it's kind of like a race. And uh, we had the stouter motors, obviously, because mine are the Merc racers and they just have pleasure boat motors in there, but they're still running and cer certainly better at throttling than me. But Philly and I were just having a gas and then it's almost dark. They pull off. They pull up. So we each follow each other back and it's black. Now it's dark. We run through hull over wide open, abreast, three abreast, three abreast through the bridge. Oh, wow. And then we <clears throat> run back towards uh, Fort Apache, three abreast. They bail at um, the hull over marina area. There was a ramp there back then. It's spectacular now, but then it was just a ramp. They peel off behind us. And I run with the Philly wide open between the, I'll never forget it between, because every time I go there now, I laugh at what we used to do. Yeah, really. So be, between the apartment and the mangroves, we're running flat out through that little channel all the way back, make this turn at a mark and go into 188 and then come off plane. And it's pitch black. So oh, yes. the marina's closed. We just dock it, tie it up in the travel lift area, and then come back the next morning and get it. Wow. We're we're just apoplectic. I mean, what an what an afternoon of experience yeah. and fun yeah. and noise, yeah. and we think we're great because we beat those two guys. You know, it was just a crazy yeah, yeah. afternoon. Awesome. So, so uh, I get on a plane and go home, and then the boat ended up at Johnny's. So what happened with with Ben Kramer though? Is he not bugging you? Because I mean, he was doing quite the sell job for <laughs> for a long time, and you didn't end up buying an Apache. So I explained to him that. Uh, I made a deal on the, the 38 cigarette and he was really fine with it. And, uh, he, and then we ended up racing against each other. He was in the cat in 86 and, and I was in the V bottom and, and, you know, we were friendly and I was really friendly with Bobby and some of his crew. And so it was just, a, now it was just a friendly competition type thing. And he never, really gave me he kept saying you should buy an apache you should buy an apache and then in 87 uh he uh unfortunately got nabbed and that was the beginning of my mission to get the 47 apache that i saw being built all that time that i was there mm -hmm. and i saw it being rigged at the at the fort apache marina and it was just such a monstrous boat, you know, it was wow boat. Yeah. And, uh, I just, I don't know. I was now I'm in a cat and with, with the Canada homes boat, but I, I just wanted that 47. I don't know. It was something so unique that McManus created and the three engines. And it, it was just a masterpiece. It was, I mean, Mark's done so, some amazing stuff, like really amazing stuff. But this one just stood out for me, and I had to have it. And uh, the uh, the story of getting that boat takes a long time, but uh, it took a while, a lot of perseverance, and then I finally got it. And then I got into the cats really hard and racing and disappointing, losing a title in '88, and came back and in. in um, a few years later and uh finally was able to get us one with the labats boat and um but that then i stopped racing and bought a 46 skater i i i eventually got the 47 and uh and then when i got the 46 skater and i had the canada homes boat and the 47 just kind of lost its appeal for me up in Toronto. It, it never got rough enough, really, to run it. And when did you actually get your hands on it? What year was okay, it? Okay, so it took till 95 to get it from mm. 86, from 87 to 95. Wow. I, there was no internet back then. There was just word of mouth. 
mm -hmm. and some phone calls and there was no emailing. Mm -hmm. So you knew where you knew where it was I at though getting, and who had it? No, I, I kept following mm -hmm. dead end stories. Gotcha, I would, okay. I got a call from New Orleans. I saw it. I said, where is it? The guy said, I, I'll, I'll go back and look for you tomorrow. It, and then it wasn't there. I never heard from the guy. So then a lot of guys knew I was looking for it. So they thought they could maybe make a few bucks finding it. Then I got stories. It had been left outside by the DEA and it's a mess. It's full of water and leaves and it's, it's a disaster. So I, I just keep tracking down leads. Nobody knows where it is. Everybody has a story. And then I get a phone call. Uh, in it was either 94 or 95, but I get a phone call. There was a publication back then called the boat trader. And it was, uh, that was, yeah, that was the evolution of the, of the uh, yellow pages, right? Yeah. For boats. <laughs> they had car yeah. trader and antique car trader yeah. and motorcycle yeah. trader. So sure. why not have a boat trader? So it was, a you know, a new, uh, sort of like a stapled together book. You bought it at seven 11 or wherever you bought that kind of stuff. And uh, he said, it's in there. I said, are you kidding? He said, no, it's, it's actually, the, it's an auction, the DEA, and it's a double page spread. Primary picture in the, well, your boat, the boat you want is the primary picture. And it looks pretty good in the picture. I said, FedEx me the boat trader. So he did. I, as soon as I got my hands on it, I just ripped it open. It was right in the gutter page, oh, it turns out to be the double page spread. Yeah. And I phone and I get the DEA on the phone because there's a number. I registered a bid. And I just asked, he said, uh, the boat is in very nice condition, still on its trailer. And uh, we even have a video of it. When you will come for the auction, we put it in the water. We had a mechanic check it all through, clean out everything, change the oil, and uh, we put fuel in it. And we have a picture of it idling at the dock from startup. Great. I, wow. I wouldn't have cared if the motors were, I didn't care as long as the boat yeah, was Yeah, yeah, right, right. That was just a bonus. Right. So I fly down to, Day uh, you can't fly to Daytona, but I flew to, I think, Jacksonville and then drove down because the auction was at Cape Kennedy. They have a yard there. Uh, I guess because of the federal thing. And so it is a potpourri of drug specials, drug dealer specials. There's AMG Mercedes. There's mm -hmm. uh, Coyote power boats. There's all, there's open fish center consoles with, you know, 700 gallons of gas tanks. And there's everything under the sun there. Crazy Jaguars and crazy colors. It was, it was like a psych psychedelic trip down there with cars and boats. Anyway, I, I go inside, I see the video, I sign up to register to bid that I'm officially there. I'm looking at the boat and I see a few friends there that are in the boat business or brokers and they say, ah, you're finally going to get your boat. And I didn't think there was anybody to bid against me because who wants it? It runs on race fuel. Uh, it's a bit outdated now, a lot outdated, you know. So the 47s m morphed into a class after Ben left. And there was like in excess and uh, Little Caesars and uh, PTM Express and uh, Ben's one of Ben's lawyers, Alan Feingold. He had uh, um, <laughs> he bought RD, RDS and and it was a forty five, and uh, so that it was a class. But they all had Merc one thousands and number six drives, right? Because of the years yeah, that had gone by, yeah, yeah. So and. It was a really stout class. He ran in Superboat against Popeyes and and uh, Team USA, among other boats. But it was now a vibrant class. So this boat's kind of outdated for that, in the sense the hull's okay, but the power is useless. But I, that wasn't my aim. It was just to get it. So we start bidding. And I had a, because of the Canadian dollar and it was weak then, I sort of had a budget I was prepared to go to, to get it. And uh, they start off the bids, let's say at 25, 30 grand, and we're going up and we're going, and then somebody keeps outbidding me. And I'm standing with a group of guys that know me and everybody's looking around to see who it is. But anyway, nobody sees the guy. And we're going up by tens at first and then nickels 
And then finally, at 100 and something, 120 or some number, 130, I gave up. I, I just went. And then he went 135 and sold. And I went all these years, and I lose it. I was so disappointed, but I didn't want to get there with with the weak dollar. It was a lot more money in Canadian funds. Then I run into a gentleman named Mercurio from France. He's the cigarette Apache dealer, Patrick mm -hmm, Mercurio, mm -hmm. and I knew mm -hmm. him. And I said, Patrick, why didn't we just make a deal? We flip a coin to see who's going to buy the boat. We were the only two bidding. You pay me not to bid, and you get your boat. Or I get my boat. Either way, but what you, you, we didn't need to bid against each other when nobody was here. Everybody right, was there when right. the crowd was like fifty grand was everybody's limit. We uh -huh, were way past uh -huh. that. We could have made a deal at sixty or seventy, and it would have gone because there was no reserve. Uh -huh. He said, "Oh, I didn't think about it. My guy really wanted it. I should have talked to you before, but I, I didn't. I was hoping you wouldn't see me." Blah blah blah. Anyway, I get back on that lonely flight home and. Uh, <laughs> I'm sitting there, and two weeks later, not two weeks later, I get a phone call. Patrick Mercurio. He says, do you want your boat? I said, well, what's up? He said, my guy got pinched in France, and he needs money for a lawyer quick. <laughs> it's like a recurring theme in the 80s. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> so I said, uh, how much? He said, just give me a decent number. He needs the money like tonight. You got to wire it like right away. And he timed the call so that it was morning for me. So I would have the chance to figure out a way of getting him the money really quick instead of calling me at night. So we arrived at a figure that was way less than I w than the auction. Oh, price. nice. Like, oh, yeah. Now, hey, you know, maybe it was meant to be after all. Anyway, right, right. he said, but I have, uh, I have to tell you before we make the deal. We sold the trailer right away because he was never going to use it in France. It's too big. And I didn't care because it was a huge fifth wheel trailer with a zillion toolboxes on it. Mm, okay. And you need a tractor to pull it. I just wanted a trailer like, you know, to pull it around Miami or wherever I brought the boat. So that didn't bother me. And then he said, the other issue is we pulled the motors already and painted the bilge. So it was all perfect. I said, that's a bonus. For me, saves me doing it. So I said, the only caveat to the deal, we made a deal number. I just need enough storage time to make a trailer. And he said, okay, the guy will pay for storage until you get a trailer. So I phoned up the guy I knew in Miami, forget his name now, but he owned Target trailers. And I, I had started with Michael, but Target was my guy. And I knew he'd have the pattern because it was a Target trailer that was under it. Mm. So it would save time, whereas Michael would have to go and measure and start over again. So my guy, I think his name was Mike, says, I don't do trailers anymore. I stopped. I just do wood, cra uh, wood um, cradles for Magnum and cigarette to go to overseas. It, it's way easier, and they're, they can be used again. I just got to repair them when they get over here. And the, and it was just crazy having all these men and welding. I said, Mikey, I need the trailer. You got, this will be the last trailer you ever build. Think of it that way. <laughs> he said, all right, I'll do it for you. So I got the last Target trailer ever built. <laughs> and uh, so it went over there. And then my race team uh, with Tom Allen still from the Canada Homes days, they went and picked it up. And we cleaned it up. And uh I ran it in Miami a little bit to test it. We ran great, brought it to Canada, and I kept it there for years. While I used it, the 46 skater showed up, another old race boat, and I was having way more fun with that because it ran so fast, you know, like almost double the speed, and, and it had the, it was fully enclosed, and it was a really good boat, really light. And uh, so I was enjoying that. And the 47 was hurting my knees, you know, with the rough. Mm. I only took it out when it was rough. And I'd have somebody just drive that wanted to go for a ride. So I had to keep an eye on them while I was throttling. And I hurt my knee once. And I went, oh, shit. So I put the boat away. And this one guy, almost from 
uh, about a year after I bought the boat from New Jersey, nice guy, kept calling me. If you ever want to sell the boat, call me. And he called maybe two, three times a year. And it was always no, 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 no. When I hurt my knee, he called me at the right time. Because I had, at that time, I think I had the Labatt's boat and uh, the 46 skater. And I didn't need any more boats. And so I thought, you know, it's time. I'd owned it 10 years. Uh, or just about 10 years. And I said, just, he said, just name your price. So I named the price. He said, okay, I'll come and pick it up on the weekend. So I thought, maybe I was too cheap. <laughs> so I said, before you come, I just want one gentleman's agreement that if you ever decide to sell the boat, you'll give me first right of refusal. And uh, he said, done. And I'm a man of my word, he said. So you take that for what it's worth. <laughs> he came up with his truck. Sorry. I, I thought he'd have troubles getting it across the border. So I had a guy drive it to him. Mm. And he asked if I would fly down as a favor to him and take him out for the first ride to show him how to use it. Because it's not for the fate of heart, this boat, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with no transmissions and stuff. And he did have a, a, a formula, but it was like a 35 or 36 formula. And this is a whole different thing. So we, I go, I fly to New Jersey. I take him out in the, in the, in the channel there and we run up to a bridge and back and he's all excited and happy and knows how to how, how everything works i gave him a little little book of instructions of what to do and the maintenance schedule etc cetera, etc cetera. never heard from him never called him and the boat went he was a um a trucking uh tow truck guy really nice guy and uh he kept it in his shop and just looked at it every day. And then my nephews, years and years later, started bugging me. You got to get that boat back. That was the greatest yeah. boat of all time. I said, what do I, I'm 100 years old. I don't need the 47 Apache anymore. And they were relentless, these two. My nephew, the older one, is now racing, you know, with Big East Construction. But at the time, the chorus between these two guys and their father wasn't much help either. Kept saying, you got to get it, you got to get it, you got to get it. So I called the guy, found his number. I don't even know how I found it. Uh, and uh, called him up and he said, no, it's not for sale, but we have our agreement. If I ever decide to sell it, you're the guy. So I started getting like him. I started calling him every six months. He said, Lauren, I told you, if I ever sell it, it's yours. First rate. But I dutifully kept calling and calling twice a year almost marked it off in a book. And then out of nowhere, he calls me. He says, uh, you still want to buy the 47? And I said, sure. What's the price? He says, well, what would you pay? I said, I have a better idea. You just tell me what you want for the boat. He just, he, a little history. He ran it once. Really, the whole time he had it? Wow. And wow. The, and the whole time he had it, and the race was black flag. So it never, nothing happened. Yeah. So he said, I got all your stuff, the spares that came with it, the spare motor, the spare drive. It's still in the mercury box. Uh, your, all the covers you made. I'm a cover guy, and I went a little overboard with different covers. But he said, everything's intact. Nothing's touched. All the stuff is here. I said, okay, we'll cut it short. You name the price but I will not negotiate. In other words, if you say a number and I think it's too high, I'm not going to say, will you take 20,000 less or 10,000 yeah, less? Yeah. I said, just name your number and I'm saying yes or no. So he said, would you pay this? With me having the first right of refusal to buy it back, him having it now, switching the... And I said, I'll accept the price. Yeah. He was like, I think so, I gave him too, too low of a price. Yes, yes. So <laughs> I said, I'll take it. And, uh, I got the boat and, uh, went down to Johnny's and what I feared, I, I paid his price because he said he had the motors redone. There was still a spare, 
And I'd done the motors already once and the spare because I'd used it enough that it, you know, and I run hard. So it's just a race motor. It's got to be rebuilt, right? You can't mm -hmm. get that many hours on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Johnny took it apart and started looking at everything, the the uh, we sent the motors to Sterling and the they were the heads were really salted out. It, the last whatever he did the last time didn't flush it very well. Headers were fine, but the heads oh, were good. sort of okay. corroded. So we yeah. so, so we redid those. I cleaned up. I redid the drives anyway. But the surprising thing was, not only was everything there, like he said, I had bought at that time brand new Lifeline V-bottom race jackets. Jackets, huh? They were still in the plastic inside the Lifeline bag. Oh. They'd never been touched. Nice. All the ropes that I sort of coordinated for the boat with their snaps, all there. Sure. Yeah. So then uh, I went in the pouches. I had made these pouches, you know, in front of each bolster. And I reached in. And the and our goggles from back then were still there. Still there. And the re, and the old registration papers were still there. Like it, the boat was untouched, literally. <laughs> so, uh, that's how I got it back, and and we fixed everything up, cleaned everything up, and started running it. And Johnny and I went out, and it was ph phenomenal, like the old days. And then um, fast forward, I just ran it a few times down there, and I got a call about this Ocean Cup thing sorry yeah. i didn't get a call i saw an ad a facebook ad yeah. so i called them nobody answered <laughs> left a voicemail uh, about two weeks later tried again nobody called me back so i figured because this is much of a you know it's not being promoted very well if you're trying to get people to run in it <laughs> and then janet called me and apologized that they're the self, there was some communication issues off of the ad, and she profusely apologized and told me that's not the way the, it, it is. It's it's a it's a really she got me all excited about it. Put it that way. What gave you the bug, though? I mean, it, 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 did you I, know just the boat was no? It was I, well. Remember, I had run with Johnny subsequently. Uh, we did. I did the Bacardi with him, and um, oh, okay. And then I did the uh, well. I did. Uh, Bob Morgan. Prior, I did the uh, four-engine boat with Bob for for two years in two hundred one, and then we won the worlds in two hundred three uh, with Big Thunder. And then, no, sorry, I did two hundred one with Bob two thousand and two hundred one. We did the we won the worlds with that boat. Then Johnny uh, got me hooked up with Dave Scott and and then Johnny and I ran did uh the national thing and uh, circuit and then uh the worlds in November and so I was still in the game that way and then um this thing came up and uh years and years later and I thought you know what there's no pressure I bet you Bobby and Johnny would really like to do it just for fun and Johnny was excited about it, but he had a conflict because he was racing with mm -hmm. uh, Taylor mm -hmm. uh, in in the uh, 450 class, and they were Lake of the Ozarks that weekend, so he couldn't go. But Bobby was really excited because he hadn't been in a race boat in forever. And uh, and as I said, I picked Ryan Beckley when Johnny was unavailable, and uh, that's how we got into it. I. I needed a couple of concessions from the from from Janet. Uh, I my boat won't splash, you know. I don't dunk the trailer, so she had to find me a marina that would work on the weekends because it was a Saturday mm -hmm. race. So we could splash Friday regular hours, but Saturday some they didn't have the travel lift operating, but they came in special for Janet. So I was really grateful for her to do that, and uh, off we went. And um, it was a nice day. We ran it uh, so that I was really nervous about breaking because of the distance. And I had a lot of hours on the boat by then, you know, 30 odd hours by then, or maybe a little more. And what engines and drives it? It didn't have it, like it, the. It, it, it's my old stuff, which was the original yeah. stuff. It's just been rebuilt wow. by Sterling 
uh, all three, yeah. but they weren't fresh anymore. They were when I put the boat back together at Johnny's uh, a, a year before, I guess it was. And so it was they had a lot of hours. The two fours and the three, I'd already redone them. And uh, so Bobby and I decided, let's just run. It's not a race. We'll never stay with the big cat. And so let's just run and enjoy ourselves and hopefully not have to come back on one or two motors because we won't get back home till Sunday. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. we ran and found a good pace. Bobby, remember, hadn't been in a boat for a while. It was a little rough in the middle of the course once we got free of uh, Palm Beach. Uh, got bouncy. Bobby found a lovely rhythm. Ryan kept us on track. And I hadn't raced where you can't see it for years. So when you're driving, you actually think you're going in a straight line using the compass, which is bouncing all over because Ryan had the uh, had a laptop uh, GPS on his side, which I could see a little bit. But with the glare and everything, I just kind of used my compass. And you go a degree or two off, you know, you end up in Cuba, right? So if you go sure. long enough. Sure. So uh, Ryan would straighten me out once in a while. And I swore I was on course, but Ryan would straighten me out again. And we made it to the checkpoint, came around that. And uh, as it turned out, we uh, missed the, the real checkpoint. We rounded up what we thought was a mark boat, and it had the... Uh, Ocean Cup flag and the people were screaming oh, on the no boat, waving, but they weren't. They were just there as a spectator boat, and we thought it was a mark boat because of all the flags and everything. And they said there may be a boat out there. As it turned out, there wasn't. It was these guys. <laughs> there but wasn't, we so, but there was. Yeah, so they docked me a time penalty ah. for mi missing it by a few seconds. We just didn't go far enough, but we got distracted by that turn boat. I said if. The turn boat just didn't fly that big ocean cup flag. Exactly, yeah. I would have, we would have kept going, but we saw that ocean cup flag. We figured it was it, and it was the ocean cup flag from the year before. <laughs> so, anyway, it was a fun deal, and so we uh, kept the same pace on the way back, running in the you know in the mid eighties, early nine eighty nine. I think was the best we ever did because we kept it at that pace, and the boat. When it's right, it's 102, 103. So we, I just wanted to save the stuff. As it turned out, uh, we did the uh, presentation, and the they really did an extraordinary job for first time, come, jumping out of the box. And uh, the the gentleman that runs um, Race World Offshore showed up, you know, which I thought was a nice gesture. Not that we're competing against them, but he's, you know, he's an offshore fanatic. Yeah, and good show of support. A, yeah, a, a real nice guy. I mean, he's really old. It, it's a different kind of Carbonell. They were both passionate, but he was he shared that passion. He's just very organized and and really does a great job with his circuit as well as really making Key West bigger and badder than it's ever been. And I I think he's a such a tribute to the sport. This gentleman, anyway, he was there, and uh, we gave him a shirt for showing up. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, I, I was just delighted he was there because it sort of brought the two, like, we were kind of authenticated sure. with his presence. Sure. sure. And, uh, you know, and the APVA sanctioned it. So it was a, it wasn't a poker run. Right, with, right, right, with, right. And uh, so Janet had arranged for the guys to show up at the travel lift. And after the presentation, I idled over there. And they were there. And the boat got lifted. Fortunately, it's close enough to uh, TNT. We could take it there and hose it down there, mm. flush it out. We didn't have to do it at the marina because they want the guys wanted to go home, obviously. And that was a great event. And um, she contacted me later and said, "We're planning on doing a one in Miami." And I said, "That's great. I'd love to do the Miami one because I could just idle over. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah, have yeah, to yeah. stay. I don't have to come up to Palm Beach." Yeah, and, and then she said, yeah, but we'd like you to do Palm Beach, too. And so I said, all right, we'll do Palm Beach as well and uh, for this year. And so the boats, since that, the, when the boat was on the trailer, I was playing with the props, 
like just spinning them in my hand and they were not good. So, and I had just put on the spare four and had rebuilt the three with whatever pieces we could find as well as the other four was rebuilt. And now they're just that hard run nonstop. And it was a bit rough in the middle of the course and all the time that was on them. They, yeah. They couldn't stand up to 30 hours or 40 hours plus yeah. a, a race of that. I, or I, one. Yeah. I'm surprised you even attempted it with those drives. Yeah. It's well, it's you know what, every, they, yeah, but they ran so good. And I look at, I wasn't ra- I, when I went out there, I'd run hard. But just for, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then Uh back it down into the 80s. Because anybody I took for a ride's like a neophyte or a boater. And I love taking, you know, guys that really appreciate that stuff for rides. Even had a guy, I'll, I'll tell you the story in a minute, but from Facebook, from Italy, I gave him a ride. He flew all the way over. No way. It was his dream to go out and ride. But, well, I'll just tell you a quick story. He there was a, I'm not a big Facebook guy, but after this Ocean Cup stuff, I started doing it a little more, uh-huh. looking at stuff. And it always pops up the stuff you like. And there was a cigarette page. And this guy said, I want to come to Miami. Could anybody give me a ride in a cigarette? It's my lifelong dream. And I'm happy to pay for gas for a ride. And I saw the ad and then I waited to see if there were comments like a day later, another day later, Uh nothing came up. It was still posted, but it never came. Nothing was there. So I just lark like for a lark. I said, would a 47 Apache race boat do? And then he goes back. Are you kidding? I said, no, (laughs) just tell me when you're coming. I'll make sure I'm in Miami because I was going down there a lot. Yeah. And he didn't, and he didn't know it was that 47 Apache. It's just a 47 Apache. Right. (laughs) So, he um we set up a time and then another guy that wanted to ride uh uh who has a apache page he said could i come for a ride and i said or i offered him because of his passion for the brand and i said look i'm taking uh, this gentleman from italy for a ride do you want to come on that ride he said sure that'd be great so the local guys there and i'm there waiting the boat's in the water and then the italian guy shows up and he is dressed so perfectly that it, we might as well have gone to a ferrari event <laughs> he had pants i'd never seen before and i thought mine were pretty good <laughs> he had running shoes that made my deck shoes look like nothing and he had on this most beautiful kind of you know polo shirt out of some fabric. A guy looked like he stepped out of Vogue magazine. Young guy. So, and his English is pretty good. So, and he's so grateful. And so we jump in and we go out, we talk all the way out because you can, because it's a long ride. And I always do the same route. I go out of Hallover and I turn right, go down a government cut and come back to Hallover. That's kind of like one leg of the old Miami race without going in the harbor. And I keep stepping the speed up. It was rough, but not crazy rough, but rough. But I step the speed up when I get confident enough that the driver's okay with it. Like he's reading the waves and we're not going off course. And uh, it's not a race. So I want to go more right into the wave than to where the mark would be maybe and angle it off a bit. So I want to go direct head C and direct following C. And so whichever way the wind's blowing. And he's driving remarkably well, you know, it, like almost too good. So we get to government cut and I give him like a turn signal, like with a swooping hand. And I back the boat down, but he's turning so nicely into the beach that I keep the speed up. And I don't back off at all. And he turns it, he sees the beach. You know, maybe it was a little dumb on my part that the guy screws up. We're gonna, it's not gonna, gonna be pretty. He turns it and we start running back. Now we're in a following sea, so I can step it up a little more. And he's keeping the boat up, beautiful course through those waves. And 
as many times as I've gone down a government cut in Hallover, I still got to remember where Hallover is when I come back because there's some mm -hmm. decoy beaches and condos that weren't there before. Now right. there are condos there. He's been out once and he dead reckons the left turn back into Hallover without me saying a word. Now, who is this guy? You know, like nobody dead reckons the turn. Yeah, yeah. He did. Coming out of there once. So I come out, I, you know, you always give them a little thrill ride going through the mixture of waves and haul over just for fun and back it off. And we're going under the bridge. And then when I'm on idle, going back to the Marine, I go, I have to say, you drive like exceptionally well. He said, yeah, well, I'm a captain of yachts oh. and I drive the tender uh, and I drive the tenders all the time. Gotcha. Back and forth. So I, gotcha. I, I, I know I'm pretty good with a boat. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, I also sail. So I'm also captain on those kind of yachts. So I said, well, wow. you really know what you're wow. doing. Wow. And very engaging young guy. Yeah. And so appreciative. We get to the, to the Marina. He wants to pay for gas. And then, you know, you're not paying for gas. And, uh, the guy that was with me, the Miami guy, they have a conversation as we're idling in. They become friendly. They go out for a coffee afterwards, and then they, the guy wanted to see Key West. So this guy jumped in the car, and they ran down to Key West just to, so he could show yeah. him Key West and then drive back again the next yeah. day. Yeah. And so uh, I've uh, had some really nice people that contact me out of the blue, or I contact them when I see their passion on Facebook yeah, sometimes. That's, yeah, that's very cool. Looking. That's that's really cool. And of you. I've, I've said, well, it's the thing is, I I've gotten so much pleasure out of this sport. I mean, my back doesn't like it. I can't even walk anymore. But the it it just I just love it out there. And yeah. this boat isn't as much fun with me driving and throttling with my left hand. So I like having somebody on the wheel makes for an easier ride for me. And uh, so anybody that is, you know, genuinely interested, because I know what I was like as a kid on the dock. Oh, I'd love to go for a ride. But, you know, how do you do that? You know, so I know that feeling of wanting to do it or owning a boat and wanting it to get in a real boat, like a race boat is like a real boat to me. I guess that's a little arrogant. But anyway, uh, so I'm happy to take people for rides. And uh, yeah. sometimes they're just standing on the dock, looking and looking. They're at TNT, and I said, "I got an empty hole." So I said, "You want to go for rides there, you kid?" I yeah, didn't know who the guy nice. is. Yeah, and then nice. uh, we, uh, and then we, you just give them that ride to government cut and back, and they really never forget it because it is pretty uh, unusual ride, you know, in a boat that you can go that fast through, you know, three, four, five foot seas. Yeah, and nice. nobody gets hurt, but the exhilaration. And I race cars too, like vintage cars. And oh, do you? It, it's it, and it's still nothing like for me, racing boats. Different thing altogether. It's obviously you got to be way more skillful, you know, a race car to do well. Um, but I don't get the joy that I get racing cars that I do. Uh, what I raced with Johnny, I was always it was a privilege. It wasn't an experience anymore. It was a privilege because you're going with Tchaikovsky, you know, um, it's, he's so good. And I don't not go for rides with Johnny. We've gone out in center console boats because he's got to test the motor for Julio Glazier. And yeah. we go and he trims it and he does everything yeah. as uh -huh. if he's racing. And we, maybe we only make it up to the intercoastal once or twice, uh -huh. but it's a, a privilege to get in a boat with him uh, short of a rowboat. Yeah. And maybe even did, a rowboat I'd try. <laughs> now, did I, did I read though, that he was the first time he raced was with you? Yeah. Yeah. He, we needed a third guy. He knew how to navigate. And he was also in those days, you needed an onboard mechanic hmm. because so many times you'd have breakdowns and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember once he used a socket, a big socket that we probably used uh, for the prop. And he used it to siphon, not to siphon, he opened the high pressure pump on the Kinsler pumps 
sprayed fuel. We were stalled out in Key West. Uh, it, one motor stalled, couldn't get it running. And he sprayed the fuel into the socket, but made a mess. He should have gone up in yeah, flames. Sure. <laughs> and he kept pouring the fuel as, as Latham was turning the motor over and it fired. Oh, my it was gosh. Just fuel starved with an airlock. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another time with Johnny, we couldn't get on plane in New Jersey. I don't know, just wouldn't go on plane that day with our prop selection. Big swell day, no wind. And Johnny just ducked down, crawled up to the bow. Made himself that, ballast. Yeah, that was enough to get it on plane. How he got back in those four footers, <laughs> we were racing. He's crawling back. Yeah, yeah. Probably but experience. That's, probably done it before. That's how, you know, Johnny. Uh, oh, yeah. I, and I used that technique on, uh, my, I had a shadow cat that would never go on playing with the crazy outboards I put on it. So whoever was uh, driving for me, I'd just make him walk up. One time it wouldn't go on a plane. Both of us went up there on the nose, on the pickle forks. With nobody at the helm. But there was no power steering, so it would just go yeah. straight. Yeah. And eventually I could feel it starting to come and come. So I told him to stay, and I ran back to the wheel, and it went on plane. So, I, But I learned that from Johnny. So uh, he's just, uh, it's just, I, I don't know, it's just, like Tchaikovsky, like, you know, any of the greatest at what they do. And he mm -hmm. is that great. And mm -hmm. it's a privilege to get in a race boat with him. And I win with him. Mm -hmm. so, like, mm -hmm. it's, you know, yeah, that's odd. another thing. Yeah, yeah. That's odd, huh? Put yeah. the best guy in with you and yeah, it happens. Yeah. But he's, he's so dedicated to his craft and has learned things that I think other guys just don't know. And that's what keeps him especially in that stock class. I mean, mm -hmm. that everybody's got the same stuff. Yeah, right. I, I mean, mean, yes, there's a yeah, new hauler. The, the, yeah. uh, the Doug Wrights have come on the scene, but the power's the same. Right, right. And Johnny still eats out wins. And then he had a sub for Torrente in a boat a couple of years ago because um, I was there because my nephew was racing. Rough race, small boat, like smaller than the other boats. Johnny jumps in with the driver and they win the race hmm. so he's just something else yeah that's awesome now um did now for this year did he have, have you guys repowered or have you done something i thought yeah, i read somewhere I, I, yeah i did everything over again so okay. we sent the motors to mikey bit of a backlog there because of key west you know get him getting prepped and how, how, big, how big are the motors exactly what they were five five and a quarter horse, something like that. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to go from, I, the injected motors, that's kind of their limit. Then you got to go to superchargers or turbos. And that's not that boat. I mean, I'm trying to keep it like it was. Where the headers, CMI, because Stellings, or sorry, Patter, uh, yeah, they're Patterson headers. The Patterson's, okay. Yeah, they're, they're not around anymore. No, no, and, no. And my and Mikey at Sterling said the headers are done. I can't believe the headers lasted that long because yeah, I can't either. That, that old it, school technology, yeah, it was yeah. just they and, didn't last. And, and the shaking that goes on and the length of those tailpipes. Oh know? yeah, 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 yeah. It's way longer than a forty-one. You know the the uh, front motor. Uh, but anyway, they we sent them the headers, prayed they would come back close. They were better than close. Yeah, I don't know how good. they did it. They, yeah. they just bolted up. And remember, with three engines clearing all that space to get out to the tailpipes, to get out to the back, because I can't go down and I can't go up and because I'm above the deck anyway almost with my tailpipes. But So they did an exceptional job. Um, and they sent me back. I wanted all the old stuff back. So I got the old headers back. Mikey did a great job on the motors as usual. I haven't fired them yet, but I know they're perfect. I got the dyno sheets. So then um, the next thing to go was basically Johnny said, we can't keep rebuilding these fours and threes. There's You're using old fours and threes to rebuild your old fours and threes. So you got you lucked out this time. You went so far and then they're gone. So why don't you just take the headache away? Those drives are at their very, very limit with these motors, as were the times. 
switch to number sixes, and you're underpowered for sixes. I bit the bullet for the originality. Uh, now that I'm doing this Ocean Cup stuff, and then, you know, I want to run a little harder, die. So I did all new sixes. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so it also affected the trim tabs. So the old big tabs had to come off. Um, mm. But I got comparable size, but instead of the width, it's the length. Mm. So they're really long and narrow. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was a substitute there. Mm -hmm. And you get rid of a lot of hardware. You know, the steering's gone. Uh, mm. Don't tell Latham that, but you kind of know. <laughs> so uh, the steering's gone. So a lot of plumbing and components are are now no longer. But these drives are so underpowered. How's the attitude of the boat and the feel of the boat with those? Well, Is it... we, I haven't, we haven't splashed yet. Um, oh, okay. okay. The, the boat, the drives are on, the tabs are on. Uh, the bilge has been repainted and the motors have been in and out because of the headers to make sure they fit. So the engines I think are going in either later this week or next week. And then the boat basically is buttoned up, ready to go. Cause we didn't change anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometime in May, uh, I'll, uh, be in Miami and Johnny and I go, he took a shot with the prop size and, uh, we'll see how that works. And, not we'll get a different set mm -hmm. but that's another thing look at the prop selection i got now with sixes yeah yeah, yeah oh yeah, i had yeah, the yeah. Other, those old cleavers on the threes and the yeah. four so three, <laughs> yeah, like old, three blade props you know but yeah. so, you, you you ran those things way longer yeah, than <laughs> yeah so uh yeah i lost a little originality but at the same time i kind of thought like a vintage car i mean a lot of them have power steering in them now. Right. There's that, there's that fine line, right? You don't yeah, want to, so. you don't want to hack it up, but also, you know what I mean? It makes it, well, in your case, I mean, with, you know, with a vintage yeah. car, it makes it a little nicer to drive and it, but like with the drives, it's be like brakes on a car. It makes it safe that, you know, now you can enjoy the thing more. So it's I'm kind not, of a good I, compromise. When you get the number of hours I like to put on this boat, I don't want to be having to rebuild drives every no. six months. Or just yeah. blow one on a bad part because I can't yeah, buy the exactly. new parts. Yeah, or, exactly. Uh, I tried to buy two brand, two fours that were rebuilt, and uh, Matt found the guy on Facebook, checked out the gear ratios with the guy, and then Matt said, uh, "My client will call you now, and and he'll take the drives." I called the guy, and they were sold <laughs> oh. before Matt even hung up the phone and <laughs> called me. So. <laughs> That kind of, yeah. I said, you know what? It's meant to be. I got to get, I got to yeah. put the sixes yeah, on. Yeah, so yeah, the sixes yeah. are on. Good choice. And the other way I look Good at choice. it, every 47 after mine had sixes. Yeah, yeah. Because they Good all choice. ditched the uh, open class motors and went to Merc 1000s. And then Bob, so Bob's going to be with you in the boat for the next run too? He'll he'll be with you? Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm changing Ryan uh, to the mechanic that's done so much work on my boat on the 47 uh really nice guy from tnt um he can now drive he he had immigration issues to get sorted out before he could go offshore because that you could get oh. tripped up with that right uh, i didn't think so he, about that yeah i didn't either you know we're going for a boat ride come back he goes yeah. on lots of boat rides but he never leaves u.s waters <laughs> so uh he got his papers finally. He's very happy. And uh, so now he's able to run. And it's nice having the mechanic on board. And he knows yeah. he knows how to navigate because he knows he set the computer up for Ryan. Nice. So, nice. Nice. Uh, or the GPS for Ryan. So yeah. we'll, uh, we'll go and, and hopefully they have the Miami event in September and, and we'll do that one as well. It's sort of a Miami Vice thing too, which is kind of fun because that was part of that era that I raced in, and we yeah. and I got to race against not in the same class, but Don Johnson was there, and that <laughs> added a whole luster to the sport back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we had. Uh, it would be nice having been a fan of Miami Vice, pretending that life a little bit in the eighties was and into the nineties was you know part of growing up and. So it'd be nice if we can be part of that. If that event yeah, has yeah. some merger capabilities yeah. with Miami Vice, which is supposed to, um, yeah. yeah, that'll be fun. And I, I can idle over. I don't, I don't have to trade yeah, the yeah, boat anywhere. Go. 
Yeah. So, well, if I ever, I've, I've messaged Don Johnson about 10 times to come on my podcast. If I ever get him, I'll point him in your direction. There you go. <laughs> tell, tell him he was, uh, he, he added a lot of obviously press, but he was not a celebrity trying to be a race boat driver. He was a race boat driver, as it turned out, that turned into a celebrity. Yeah, that's the way I look cool. at it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's and cool. He, and, he, and he did, similar to me, I mean, he went out in that in the Chris Craft at first, the Stinger, I guess it was, and got used to running boats. And then he got in the Scarab and he ran that boat, you know, when in really rough stuff that, you know, you could see tubs hanging on for dear life in the footage. And I think that's what hooked him up on the sport. And uh, he introduced himself, similar to me, with a V-bottom in Superboat, a scarab. And uh, and then got Team USA together with uh, Richie Powers. And they, you know, they had their growing pains, but they pulled it off. And uh, it, it he was such a, he was a real important cog in the sport after coming off those Miami Vice years, you know, where mm -hmm. everything was, mm -hmm. you know, and car racing had the same issue, you know, with the John Paul Jr. and Sr. and and some other uh, guys that raced cars that were backed up with uh, drug money. So Don Johnson really put the sport on the map. You know, we were in Sports Illustrated, a lot of television coverage. Uh, so, and he was, a, he was such a low key in the sport for us. Like he, he sat in the driver's meeting that like never made any press allowed in and he just wanted to race and he was really good. You know, mm -hmm. Richie said the guy could really flat out drive. Yeah. Nice. And uh, it was a great boat to look at and, and they, they did re really, really well. So he helped. He was a real important element in that sport in those years. I don't think he gets enough credit for, how he brought it into mainstream, more mainstream than it, mm -hmm. than it, mm -hmm. than it, than it could have been without his presence. Because yeah. we'd had other guys, you know, we had Chuck Norris and with Popeyes. But Don Johnson was Don Johnson. Right, know, right, that, right. That changed it. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. It's really good to hear. I've never really talked about him before in that, that light, so that's good to hear. Yeah, because there's lots of guys that dabble in things as celebrities for press. He came to race. He was ferocious. He wanted it. He wanted to win bad, and uh, he and and he did. And uh, he dragged the press with him, and that was the the great benefit to the sport. So he he brought the sport, advanced it in the public's eye, way better in in a much better fashion than than the uh, sort of fantasy drug days, you know, where yeah, where yeah, it was yeah. a yeah. notorious sport. He made it main. He made it mainstream, mm -hmm. and got us mainstream coverage, real tele television coverage because of him. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it, not enough credit goes to him for what he did for our sport. So then, for next year, that or for this year, you're going to do the, the two Florida runs. Sounds like. Yep. Yeah, California is just too far to go, uh, and the wear and tear on the boat, bouncing away all the way to California and back. Oh, you know, okay. It's, it's an old boat now. So, yeah, yeah. So that kind of, no, nobody ever talks about over the road bumping and grinding. And I think that's even harder than the waves, you know, so yeah, certainly less right. forgiving. Yeah. Well, you got the suspension of the trailer, but it only, it's shaking and rattling at, you know, a solid 60, 70 miles an hour for uh, for days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd rather avoid that and um, and just do the famed races or famed events, not races really, but the famed events, especially Miami to Bimini and back. That's, that's really authentic old school stuff. And, and I really look forward to that one. I, I hope that they were able to uh, keep the uh, promotion going on that event so that, it, that we can be successful in the inaugural year. Yeah. Cool. And the, and the boat you mentioned structurally, I mean, the boat's still obviously in good enough shape yeah, to I get out there. Yeah, I had one with it. Uh, so where it cracked in an area that Mark McManus said it should, it, that if it was ever going to crack, that's where it would be. And uh, there's an amazing glass guy in Miami and he remedied it. And uh, I took it for probably two hard, hard runs before I painted it. 
just to see if it would crack, you know, because what's the point of bringing in the painter and there's so sure. much graphic, like small amounts, but names and all the different design work that's where this crack was. So once it all got sanded off and I saw how much space was required to remedy the repair, and it was right at the back side of the bolster on the port side where I throttled. And uh, he fixed it, Eddie, um, Wadardo, just a magician with glass repairs. And uh, I, it's never had a problem ever since. Painted perfect. So nice. the boats had the drives off once during the rebuild and now again with the uh, sixes. That transom is as solid as the day it was built. Nice. So that that's nice. also encouraging. I mean, Mark, over, it, when he built light, he built light, but his boats are so overbuilt that they're just, you know, they're, they're never going to break. Yeah, I mean, you, you, the only time I've yeah. ever seen an Apache break is when it fell off the trailer. Ah, that's cool. And it's just, I mean, it's just so iconic. It's just, yeah. The paint, yeah, everything the, about the it. Paint, just, yeah, it's just, the paint job is, yeah, it's a Gale special. And she was the first person, in my view, that ever did these real big graphics on boats. You know, there was colors mm -hmm. and stripes, mm -hmm. but not any of these, like, banners unfurling. And banner art, it's called, basically. And she pioneered it, certainly. And she's uh -huh. stick to what she does. And she came down and painted it for me. You know, the lightning bolt oh, and nice. the name. So I got her to sign the boat. She previously painted my other Apache race boat. I had several of them, but the last one I had was uh, from Europe. It was a black boat. And just, I always loved the banner paint job. So I redid the boat as a banner paint job and she did it all. Mm -hmm. You know, nice. she, still nice. had the, she still had the tissue paper uh, for the, you know, the musket and the American flag and, and the uh, tomahawk for the American. She still had all the original artwork. So she just laid it really? out there. Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh, so very cool. I had her sign the hatch there too. And so she's always, always been instrumental in all the boats and she's just a wonderful girl, person, whatever. It just such yeah. a great, the fact that she would come down and do this on her time. I mean, I paid her, but that she would do it uh -huh. and want to do it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And uh -huh. so it was, it was great that she'd come back and do the 47 as well. Because it was all yeah. hand done, you know. There was no, oh. it was just hand painted. Well, well, fantastic! I forgot to ask you. So you said you're on Facebook now. Can people come see pictures of the boat on Facebook if they find you, or uh, they can? I have some Instagram posts from some runs in this Inst boat. So uh, okay, some promotion. Like I did some promotion for a magazine, and he, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he took the video and and. I sent it to me and I just posted it on my own Instagram account. So there's a couple okay, there. Okay. And there's a guy that take there's a guy that takes photos coming into Hallover and some people like once I oh, went yeah. by myself and another time this guy a couple guys came with, I think they got shot by the drone or whatever the guy uses from the from the jetty mm -hmm. to shoot. And mm -hmm. so you could find the, the boat running there. And then Janet had some footage. Uh, as I recall, coming around, I think it's on my Instagram page where we turn. Okay, I was looking. Okay, so yeah. it's just uh, your Instagram is just Lauren Label and it's or Lauren Label and it's L O R N E L E I B E L. Yeah, I don't know if Janet's and footage put, is there. I think that's on the Ocean yeah, Cup footage. It, it's pretty. It's pretty impressive the way she yeah. did that. The boat. I'll, throw, I'll throw some pictures of the boat in 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 this video, and um, obviously anybody that doesn't know what you're talking about. It's this is the Apache. This is the Number one boat, the first boat, the first 47 built, correct? That's what, zero, zero, 001. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's got number 69 on it, big Apache on the side, yellow, and it's just a beautiful boat. It's iconic. So um, I'm sure most of you just, just search for 47 Apache, and I'm sure it'll probably come up if you if you don't find it on the on the Instagram. So yeah awesome well thank you for um thanks for taking the time appreciate it very very nice of you to, to do that and uh cool hearing about the boat the boat's just fantastic and and uh, your career if anybody uh in uh, google lauren he's got a long long history obviously which you can tell by what he talked about long history in offshore racing so yeah. thanks for if sharing you, with us uh if you 
need to call me back again because you need something filled in or you want to editorialize it a little more and you need some more filler, don't hesitate to call me and we can do it again for wh- oh, awesome. whatever you need. Awesome. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe we'll get on the phone after you, after you do a couple of the runs and we can talk about those and how sure. those went. So. Sure. For sure. Anytime. So. I appreciate it. All right. Great. All right. Thanks again, Lauren. Yeah. Take okay, care. Pal. Be well. Thank you for listening to Powerboat Talk. If you like what you've heard, please head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more Powerboat Talk, follow us on Facebook or Instagram or visit our website at powerboattalk.com.